Hey everyone, you ready to go over chapter 17 from Mental Chemistry? I know I am. This chapter, we're going to be talking about metaphysics. And, um, I'm listening to this audio, it's called Awaken the Force, and it's Kundalini Meditation Music with Binaural Beats. And for those of you that don't know what Kundalini is, I'm going to explain it to you right now. The Kundalini is the metaphysical and esoteric energy force that resides in us which consists of energy channels and centers or chakras. This brainwave entrainment music track was created for deep meditation, awakening of our primal energy, useful during prana, pranayama breathing exercises. Yoga stimulates a spiritual connection as we become aware of our energy core. The binaural beats range from 4 hertz to 8 hertz and uses the frequency orbit of the sun, which is connected to the hara. So, Metaphysics Creation consists in the art of combining forces which have an affinity for each other. In the proper proportion, thus oxygen and hydrogen combined in the proper proportions produce water. Oxygen and hydrogen are both invisible gases, but water is visible. Germs, however, have life. They must therefore be the product of something, of something which has life or intelligence. Spirit is the only creative principle of the universe and thought is the only activity which spirit possesses. Therefore, germs must be the result of a mental process. A thought goes forth from the thinker, it meets other thoughts for which it has an affinity. They coalesce and form a nucleus for other similar thoughts. This nucleus sends out calls into the formless energy, wherein all thoughts and all things are held in solution. And soon the thought is clothed in a form in accordance with the character given to it by the thinker. A million men in the agony of death and torture on the battlefield send out thoughts of hatred and distress. Soon another million men die from the effect of a microbe called the influenza germ. None but the experienced metaphysician knows when and how the deadly germ came into existence. As there, is, as there are an infinite variety of thoughts, so there are an infinite variety of germs, constructive as well as destructive but neither the constructive nor the destructive germ will germinate and flourish until it finds congenial soil in which to take root. All thoughts and all things are held in solution in the universal mind. The individual may open up his mental gates and thereby, and therefore, and thereby become receptive to thoughts of any kind or description. If he thinks that there are magicians, witches, or wizards who are desirous of injuring him, he is thereby opening the door for the entrance of such thoughts. And he will be able to say with Job, the things I have feared, the things I feared have come upon me. If, on the contrary, he thinks that there are those who are desirous of helping him, he thereby opens the door for such help, and he will find that, as thy faith is, so be it unto thee, is as true today as it was two thousand years ago, and the master metaphysician was Jesus the Messiah. Tolstoy said, Ever more and more clearly does the voice of reason become audible to man. Formerly men said, Do not think, we believe. Reason will deceive you, faith alone will open you to the true happiness of life. And man tried to believe, but his relations with other people soon show, showed him that other men believed in something entirely different, so that soon it became inevitable that he must decide which faith which faith out of many he would believe, reason alone can decide this. Attempts in our day to instill spiritual matters into man by faith, while ignoring his reason, are precisely the same as attempts to feed a man and ignore his mouth. Men's common nature has proven to them that they have a common knowledge, and men will never more and men will never more return to their former errors. The voice of the people is the voice of God. It is impossible to drown that voice, because that voice is not the single voice of any person, any one person, but the voice of all rational consciousness of mankind, which is expressed in every separate man. Now, it's very interesting that he says that. The voice of the people is the voice of God. For God lives in you, and he is expressing himself through you. Your, your words have power. When you speak, you are literally giving form and shape to your thoughts, because they are your thoughts expressed. 
Reason tells man that the universe is a cosmos and is therefore governed by law, so that when we see that some persons secure extraordinary results by mental or spiritual methods, reason tells us that we can all do exactly the same thing, because the law is no respecter of persons, and that this is being done every day all the time, everywhere, is apparent to everyone who has taken the trouble to ascertain the facts. All manifestations are governed by principles, which we recognize as universal laws, and in the manifestation of those laws we recognize systems, order, and harmony. In the infinite, if the infinite is omnipresent, it must encompass and inf interfiltrate all that seems to be matter and be one with it and inseparable from it. So basically what he was saying, if the infinite is everywhere present, then it must be within all of matter. Because all of matter is nothing but densified energy. The force behind everything visible is the force of the spirit, energy, God, cosmic intelligence. Science teaches that so-called matter exists in a diversity of grades, from its crudest visible form to the most refined, refined and invisible state in an ins inseparable relationship with spirit, from which it can never be disassociated. So, spirit and matter can never be separated, for they are one. I and my father are one, I am. The Latin or electric power in the gaseous condition of the elements acts through vibrations upon all matter and the combinations lower than the gases by induction, raising them also to a fluidic or gaseous condition and enabling them to form new combinations on a higher plane. By the same principle, is the mineral raised to the sphere of electricity, magnetism, or light, which of themselves are nothing more than ether in different velocities of vibration. Radioactivity consists in setting in motion certain electric vibrations, which after passing through the ether, record themselves on a distant receiver. The whole system depends on the intangible, intangible substance known as ether. It is a substance, invisible, colorless, odorless, inconceivably rare field, which fills all space. This substance is consciousness substance, energy. It fills the space between the earth and the sun and the stars, and it also fills the minute space between the atoms of the densest substance, such as steel. Even when electricity passes through a wire, it is merely a vibration of the ether, which circulates between the atoms composing the copper wire. In turn, we have abundant proof of the subjection of ethereal matter by the still more rare-filled sphere of force, which we recognize as psychic force or mind force. Matter thus refined becomes the plastic associate of the mind for the transmission of its forces and the manifestation of its power. <sighs> I'm sorry, you guys. I think I'm going to... I'm going to... put on a my uh, alpha waves really quick because this thing is making me feel like meditating and uh, <laughs> I need to stay focused because this information is very important so just give me a <laughs> give me a quick second um, history Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, I guess that definitely shows a difference between the frequencies that you hear in the world within and how it really does affect what goes on in the world without. Let me skip this ad really quick. Okay, now we can continue. Okay, first I need to find where I was. Okay, I'll read this part again. In turn, we have abundant proof of the subject, subjugate, subjugation of ethereal matter by the still more rare-filled sphere of force, which you recognize as psychic force or mind force. Matter thus refined becomes a plastic associate of the mind for the transmission of its forces and the manifestation of its power. 
Matter thus refined becomes the plastic associate of the mind for the transmission of its forces and the manifestation of its power. Basically saying matter is the channel in which the spiritual energy can manifest itself in physical form. That mind does transmit its forces through or by its vibrations. We have proof of it. We have proof of in the expression of its power of mind over mind. As in the manifestation of the mind of the hypnotist over his subject through mental suggestion, by which he is enabled to control the entire organism of his subject to such an extent as to suspend the functions of the organs of the body at will. And like I said, uh, there is a book that I will be reading to you guys. It's by uh, William Walker Atkinson. It's uh, Mental Influence. And he goes into detail about how hypnotists are able to do what they do to certain subjects by using mental force and powers. Thus we see that the subtle or refined elements of matter at the disposal of the mind are subject to his control. Matter in itself has no consciousness or feeling. It is active only when controlled by spirit or mind and in accordance with the laws that govern its actions. And when active gives forth, and when active gives forth from the manifestation and power of the spirit, mind or intelligence behind it and acting upon it and it is and in its varied manifestations symbolizes the wisdom or intelligence of the mind of man or the or of the infinite mind itself as the infinite mind rules and governs the universe so it is ordained for man to rule and govern his living universe which he has created or evolved known as the temple of the living god an abridgment or microcosm of the universe of the infinite. Wisdom is a proper... Hold on, you guys. Give me a minute. Sorry guys, I had to close the door really quick. Uh, my family is leaving right now. Um, yeah, I guess that really proves that this is definitely what you're supposed to do when you can't even, you know, when that's all you want to do. Sometimes I forget I need to eat. Okay. Okay, let me read this part again. As the infinite mind rules and governs the universe, so it is ordained for man to rule and govern his living universe, which he has created or evolved, known as the Temple of the Living God, an abridgment or microcosm of the universe of the infinite. Microcosm of the universe or infinite. It is through us. God has embodied himself through us. We are our own universe within ourselves. Like I had been saying, in the external world, it is the universe or is a world that we all share collectively and experience collectively. But we all have our own personal universe within ourselves. It is our own personal world within. And we're all here to do what God has sent us here to do, which is our life purpose. And, you know, you do what God has made you to do because only, only then can not only He advance through us, but this planet itself will be better off. Wisdom is a proper use of knowledge to bring about harmony, happiness, ease, and health. Ignorance is the darkness which the light of truth disperses, which light alone can enable us to understand the priority of mind and the control of matter. The office of metaphysics is to bring man into a true comprehension of his relationship with the world, in which he lives, moves, and has his being and an understanding of how to gain dominion over all which is his rightful heritage. The metaphysician... Hold on, you guys. I 
I just want to make sure you guys are focusing and paying attention and not having to hear the uh, the background noise because this information is really important. I want to stay focused and I really need you to stay focused because we are the future. Me and you, we have the power. And I hope I'll be able to shine the light on you, which is my mission, which is God has sent me to do. The office of metaphysics is to bring man into a true comprehension of his relationship with the world, in which he lives, moves, and has his being, and an understanding of how to gain dominion over all which is his rightful heritage. The metaphysician gives the patient nothing which he can see, nothing which he can hear, nothing which he can taste, nothing which he can smell, and nothing which he can feel. It is therefore absolutely impossible for the practitioner to reach the objective brain of the patient by any way whatever. It will be said that he may give a mental suggestion, he may send him a thought. This might be possible if it were not for the fact that we do not consciously receive the thoughts of others except through the medium of the senses. Again, admitting that it might be possible to reach the conscious mind without the aid of any material agency the conscious or objective mind would not receive it because the objective mind is the mind with which we reason, plan, decide, will, and act. The practitioner invariably suggests perfection, and such a thought would be instantly dismissed by the objective mind as contrary to reason and therefore unacceptable, so that no result would be accomplished. The mind which the metaphysician calls into action is the universal, not the individual. Their formula is, divine mind always has met and always will meet every human need. Abundance is a natural law of the universe. God is our supply. You have to trust Him. You can't do everything on your, you can't do everything on your own. All you can do is do your part and let Him do the rest. This divine mind is the creative principle of the universe. It is the Father which the Nazarene had in mind when He said, it is not I that doeth the work, but the Father that dwelleth within me. He doeth the work. Hmm. <laughs> it will at once become apparent that this power which the metaphysician utilizes is spiritual, not material, subjective, not objective. For this reason it becomes necessary to reach the subconscious mind instead of the conscious mind. Here then is the secret of the efficacy of the method. The sympathetic nervous system is the organ of the subconscious mind. This, nervous, this system of nerves governs all the vital processes of the body, the circulation of the blood, the digestion of food, the building of tissues, the manufacture and distribution of the various secretions. In fact, the sympathetic nervous system reaches every part of the body. And I want to kind of go over what the sympathetic nervous system is really quick. He is saying that it is the organ of the subjective mind which is very true and now that I think about it more and more it can't be any more from the truth because the sympathetic nervous system is the system of nerves that reacts to things before you consciously think about it like let's say you touch something that's very very hot you automatically react to it you pull it away you subconsciously pull it away your sympathetic system of nerves takes it a lot quicker the sympathetic system of nerves reacts to it before your conscious mind even receives the message. And yeah, that's that's basically it in a nutshell. Um, like I've been saying, I will be reading how the <laughs> the nervous system works from the my NASM book. Um, yeah, we'll we'll keep going from there. All vital processes are carried on subconsciously. They seem to have been purposely taken out of the realm of the conscious and placed under the control of the power which would be subject to no change or caprice. The subject mind, the subconscious mind, the divine mind are there, therefore simply different terms of indicating the one mind in which we live and move and have our being. We contact this mind or w by will or intention. Mind is omnipresent. We may therefore contact it anywhere and everywhere. Neither time or space require consideration. As spirit is the creative principle of the universe, a subjective realization of the spiritual nature of man and his consequent perfection is taken up by the divine mind and eventually manifested in the life and experiences of the patient. Some will say that this ideal state of perfection is never realized. 
To be sure, the great teacher anticipated this criticism, for he, for did he not say, In my father's house there are many mansions. Wow, in my father's house there are many mansions. In, um, in, uh, How the Mind Works by Christian D. Larson, he talks about how there are many different levels of consciousness that within your mind it could be likened to a mansion that you could enter one state of consciousness and think from that state and that state of consciousness will in turn be an expression of your outward thinking and then if you enter another state of consciousness that state of consciousness will then in turn be your expression and um Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the indicating that there are many degrees of perfection, and although that although the law operates with immutable precision, the operator may be uninformed or inexperienced. The ability to throw the thought up and beyond the evidence of the senses into the realm of the uncreate, where all that ever was or ever will be is waiting to be brought forth to be organized developed and crystallized into tangible form is not the work of the enthusiast who has just come into the knowledge of his spiritual inheritance it is rather the work on the one who has become responsive to the most subtle vibrations he who can hear the voice of the silence he who has come into the terrible realization that the oasis he saw as he passed over the desert it was but a mirage and as he approached it receded. He who is no longer astonished or amazed to find that, after all, real power is impersonal, that it may make a super beast of one and a superman of another. A great many do not understand the principle of metaphysics and the method of applying it so as to work intelligently on their own behalf. Under such conditions, they can only expect to rely on someone else, and when that is done continually or at frequent intervals, it tends to weaken rather than strengthen the spiritual factor in consciousness. So basically saying there that under such conditions they can only expect to rely on someone else and when that is done continually or at frequent intervals it tends to weaken rather than strengthen the spiritual factor in consciousness. That basically means if there's anything that needs to be done, you have to make it happen. You have to do it, and you can't always rely on somebody else because you won't be growing as a consciousness. You will not be learning. You will not be taking the initiative to make it happen by yourself. You know, you're not. If you're always looking for someone else's help, you will never be able to originate what lies within you. Wow! <laughs> that is really cool. It is therefore desirable and necessary to secure an understanding of the nature of truth. Most persons who have become interested in metaphysics has, have had some wonderful experience or they know of someone who has had such an experience. It has been declared by philosophers, religionists, and scientists again and again that no proof of the existence of the absolute truth is possible. In other words, that the only way in which a man can be convinced of the creative power of truth is by demonstration, or by assuming that truth is all-powerful, and then on the basis of this assumption, make the demonstration. This is proof. This is freedom. This is why it has been said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Observation of the characteristic manifestations of anything and deductions based upon such observations constitute knowledge of that thing. It will readily be seen, therefore, that if you have observed and <sighs> sorry about that, you guys. Um, they just keep leaving the door open, and I need to get through this with you. Observation. I'm going to read the, the paragraph again. Observation of the characteristic manifestations of anything and deductions based upon such observation constitute knowledge of that thing. 
It will readily be seen, therefore, that if you have observed and have become aware of the fact that certain characteristic manifestations of truth, you will have knowledge. If it should come to pass that you had observed and carefully noted all the characteristic manifestations of truth, and then in addition perceive the uniformities that run through those manifestations, especially if they are complex, and see the laws or systems upon which their characteristics are based, then your knowledge of truth would be complete. Through the mental and spiritual awakening of a century ago, which was responsible for modern progressive thought, Certain higher forces and principles were discovered in the mind of man, and in the same way, new realms of thought and spiritual reality were opened to consciousness. Revelations, literally, that give life a changed and marvelous meaning, and that cause the cosmos to extend into infinity, seemingly in every direction, and therefore a twofold purpose appeared at the very beginning of this movement, to know the real man, and to know the real cosmos an ancient desire, but which was reborn at this time, and with so much life and virility, that it has become today a sole passion in the minds of millions. When then are the characteristics of truth, or, I'm sorry, what then are the characteristics of truth? All agree that in the philosophical sense, truth is wis, truth is that which is absolute and changeless. Truth must then be a fact. Then, what then is a fact? Well, three times, three times three equals nine. That is a fact. Always was a fact. Always will be a fact. There can be no evasion, no argument, no equiv equivocation, no equivocation, equivocation, equivocation. This sounds like it would be something like equivalent, but just to make sure, we should probably check it out. We are learning every day. The use of equivocal or ambiguous expressions, especially in order to mislead or hedge, and equivocal. Okay. Equivocal, allowing the possibility of several different meanings as a word or phrase especially with an intent to deceive or misguide, susceptible of double interpretation, of doubtful nature or character. Okay. So, there can be no evasion, no argument, no equivocation, no misleading. It is truth in the United States, in China, in Japan. It is true everywhere, all the time. A fact exists in the nature of things without beginning, without end, without limitation. It governs our actions and our commercial operations. Those who would undertake to disregard it would do so at their peril. It is, however, a fact which you cannot see, you cannot hear, you cannot taste, nor can you smell or feel it. It is inapprehensible to any of the physical senses. It is, therefore, any less a fact. It is without color, size, or form. It is for this reason any less true? Is it for this reason any less true? It is without years. Is it... Ugh. Ah. Hmm. Just breathe. It is without years. It is for that reason, not the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm sorry, these are these are all questions. Uh, I'm sorry, you guys, I've been reading all day. I, uh... Let me try reading that again, because the way I read it made it sound very weird. <laughs> it is, however, a fact which you cannot see, you cannot hear, you cannot taste, nor can you smell or feel it. It is inapprehensible to any of the physical senses. It is therefore... Is it therefore any less a fact? Is it without color... Uh, it is without color, size, or form. Is it for this reason any less true? Is it, it is without years. Is it for that reason not the same yesterday, today, and forever? You may use this fact as long as you live. Millions of other persons may use it as often as they like. That will not destroy it. 
Use does not change it. Use does not change it from everlasting to everlasting. Three times equals nine. Three times three equals nine. This is therefore a fact for the truth. Mm. More authenticity, less perfection. Just keep reading, bro. Truth is the only possible knowledge which man can possess, because knowledge which is not based upon truth would be false, and would therefore not be knowledge at all. Counterfeit money is not true money. It is false, however much it may pass for true. The truth is therefore all that anyone can know, for what is not truth does not exist. Therefore we cannot know it. We all think we know much that is not so, but what is not so does not exist. Therefore we cannot know it. Therefore, the truth or absolute knowing is the only possible knowledge and any other use of the word is not scientific or exact. The metaphysicians of the East will not give out spiritual knowledge miscellaneously. They will not give it to children or young people except under conditions when they have them directly under control and directly under instruction as definitely as we have our children under instruction in the intellectual life in our schools. In India, when a young man is to be initiated into things spiritually, a definite seven years course is provided for him under a master, and he is given first the things that he first bout to know along those lines. He is forewarned with regard to dangers that may arise, and the whole course of his journey is guarded by his master with the greatest care, so as to prevent his stumbling during the early stages. If spiritual metaphysics becomes popular in our Western world, the same thing will develop here. People will not take up the most advanced work before becoming acquainted with the simpler forms of knowledge. Attainment amplifies obligations. If you are somewhere up the ladder of culture, if you have entered the school of understanding, if you have seen the light of spiritual truth, you are supposed by that very fact to know more than the one who has not yet arrived your nervous system will automatically organize itself on a higher plane. And because of this, you must live closer to the law of your being or experience suffering more quickly. There are no exceptions to the law. The resurrection from the dead is not a process of getting corpses out of the grave. It is the elevation of mentalities from the plane on the, of the material to the plane of the spiritual. It is crossing the river Jordan and entering the promised land. And this is what it meant when Jesus brought people back from the dead. He brought them, he elevated up into the spiritual plane. It is not until one becomes acquainted with the laws governing in the spiritual world that he really begins to live. Consequently, those who are still functioning in the material world are dead. They have not yet been resurrected. They are not yet... They have not yet been resurrected. Eyes have... Eyes have they, but they not. Eyes have they, but they see not. Ears have they, but they hear not. Those who have been raised to the spiritual plane find that there are many practices which must be dropped. In most cases, these principles leave the individual without. These practices leave the individual without difficulty. They drop away from their own accord, and when the individual persists in functioning in the old world, he usually finds that. A house divided against itself will not stand. Wow. Yeah, it won't stand. And frequently must suffer sev severely before he learns that he cannot violate spiritual laws with impunity. <laughs> and that's kind of something that dawned on me just several days ago, which is the reason why I started doing what I'm doing now and reading all this to you guys because I ran away from I had been running from my purpose because I've always known what I was put here to do and yeah it was hard because it's so much more far-fetched than what people around me are like, but, uh, God told me now I'm ready, which is why I'm here recording this. So that's the end of chapter 17. 
on metaphysics. We're going to be going over chapter 18 right now, philosophy. If you like this video, please subscribe and share it. And uh, I'll see you guys on the other side of the galaxy. Love y'all.